from the Jesus Storybook Bible. The Teeny Weeny True King. God's people had a new land. Now they wanted a king. But God is our king, Samuel told them. He is the one who looks after you best. We want a real king, they said, one we can see. God knew that a king might not be kind to his people or look after them as well as he would, but God's people didn't care. They wanted a king and they wanted him now. So God gave them a king. He was called Saul and he seemed like a good king at first, but he became proud and stopped listening to God. He didn't obey God or love God with his whole heart. Saul can't help me with my plan, God said. I need a king who loves me and will teach my people to love me. I need a true king. God had just the one in mind. Go to Bethlehem, God told Samuel. You'll find the new king there. Samuel's job was to listen to God and to tell people what God said. So Samuel went to the little town of Bethlehem. God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house. God was going to choose one of Jesse's sons to be the new king. Jesse had seven strong sons. Now in those days, if you were going to be the king, you didn't have to be the richest or the cleverest, although that was always nice. You had to look like a king, which meant you had to be the tallest and the strongest so you could carry the longest sword and biggest armor and defeat everyone. And it didn't hurt to be handsome either. Samuel asked Jesse to bring him each son in turn. So Jesse brought the oldest, tallest, strongest son. This must be the new king, Samuel thought. He looks like a king. But God didn't choose him. You're thinking about what he looks like on the outside, God told Samuel. But I am looking at his heart, what he looks like on the inside. So Jesse showed Samuel his next oldest, tallest, strongest son. But God didn't choose him either. In fact, God didn't choose any of the seven sons. Samuel said, is that all? Jesse laughed. Oh, well, there's the youngest one, but he's just the weakling of the family. He's only teeny. Bring him, said Samuel. Jesse's youngest came running up and God spoke quietly to Samuel. This is the one. His name was David. He has a heart like mine, God said. It is full of love. He will help me with my secret rescue plan, and one of his children's children's children will be the king, and that king will rule the world forever. Samuel anointed David's head with oil, which was a special way to show that you are God's chosen king. You will be the new king one day, Samuel told him. And sure enough, when he grew up, David became king. God chose David to be king because God was getting his people ready for an even greater king who was coming. Once again, God would say, go to Bethlehem. You'll find the new king there. And there, one starry night in Bethlehem, in the town of David, three wise men would find him. to be continued. Well, good morning, Sanctuary, or if you are joining us in the evening service, good evening. It is good to be with you. Today is Christ the King Sunday, a day in the church calendar that focuses our worship on the cosmic reality of Christ's reign over the world. 
What a needed reminder in this time. On Christ the King Sunday, the church declares to all that everything in creation and culture must submit to Jesus. On this day, we are invited to actively and joyfully, joyfully submit to his rule. Next Sunday marks the first Sunday of Advent. And all too often in this season, we skip straight to Christmas, to the baby in the manger. And in doing that, we miss the emphasis and the anticipation of Christ's second coming that's highlighted during Advent. Today on Christ the King Sunday, we pause in reverence to acknowledge and to honor Jesus who came to be the Prince of Peace. From Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. And from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Friends, let us worship the Lord, Christ the King, together today.
it is Thanksgiving week and I am gonna rename it gratitude week gratitude day that's right renamed gratitude is something easy for me to talk about uh, much harder to live I'm very much uh, it's easier for me to complain and think about what I'm frustrated with uh, Scripture challenges us to not only pray for things, but also be grateful. Henry Nowen is, uh, he's the gratitude grandmaster, maybe. He says, gratitude goes beyond the mine and thine and claims the truth that all of life is a pure gift. In the past, I always thought of gratitude as a spontaneous response to the awareness of gifts received, but now I realize that gratitude can also be lived as a discipline. The discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all I am and have is given to me as a gift of love, a gift to be celebrated with joy. And the, the uh, spiritual examine, Ignatius spiritual examine, picks up on this, and in the examine, it says, review the day with gratitude. So challenge one this week, before you go to bed, when you wake up in the morning, what are you grateful for? Tell God. Uh, I was listening to a, a little podcast by my buddy Han, who I was in seminary with, and he, one of his quotes uh, that I took away was, it's dangerous not to be grateful. And finally, uh, in Winnie the Pooh, Piglet, Piglet thinks, or Piglet noticed that even though he had a very small heart, it could hold a rather large amount of gratitude. So I wanted us to practice gratitude. What are we grateful to God for? We're gonna come back in a, f in a few minutes, but I want you to grab some white paper, some markers and write down a word, draw a picture of what you are grateful for. So we'll do that and we'll come back. Psalm 148, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all stars of light. Praise him highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. And he has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds fulfilling his word mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven, and he has lifted up a horn for his people, Praise for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. Okay, we've had a little bit of time. Hopefully we've had enough time to draw a picture or write a word about what we are grateful for. Uh, so what I want us to do is hold it up for the camera. And it... We might have to look in the little sidebar and scroll up and down and see what people have written. Um, but let's take a few moments to do that. And this will be our prayer of gratitude to God for these things.
but you can keep pulling them up so we can keep uh, looking at them. I'm gonna close this in a verbal prayer. Jesus, we are thankful for you. We are thankful for your work on the cross. Give us hearts of gratitude, even in the midst of everything that's going on. Uh, help us to practice that discipline. We love you. Amen. Let's continue in worship by rereading Psalm 95 together. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to avert. From a throne of endless glory to the cradle in the dark. So praise the Father and praise the Son and praise the Spirit three in one.
Well, hello there. I want to begin today with one of my favorite Annie Dillard quotes. On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake and take offense. Or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Again, that's from Annie Dillard. And I love the way that she describes the power and the majesty of the God that we claim to worship and how so often we come with so little sense of that power and that majesty, that holiness. And that perhaps our Sunday best ought to include a little protection. Worship... uh, Worship looks very different right now. And I think a lot of us think of the ways in which we would like worship to be different and not over Zoom. And and a lot of those uh, preferences that we are drawn to uh, ultimately are about our comfort. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But one of the insidious side effects can be that we primarily begin to think of worship as about us or what suits our needs. It makes us feel comfortable, makes us feel better about ourselves. And this Dillard quote uh, reminds us that we worship a holy God and that if our primary goal is convenience and comfort, uh, perhaps we should just give up this endeavor altogether or perhaps we've missed the main point. However, if we're measuring worship by levels of inconvenience, we're not even in the same conversation as the Israelites wandering through the desert. Zoom is inconvenient, for sure. It's not as good as being together in person. No one's arguing that. But we come right now in our journey through Exodus to the last part of Exodus. And really, as we look at these last uh, 15 chapters, really, Minus a couple of chapters, this whole section is detailed descriptions of what worship should look like as the Israelites journey through the desert on their way from Egypt, where they've left slavery behind, and on their way towards the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey that God has covenanted and committed to bringing his people to. How they are to worship God in the desert is what Exodus Uh, 25 through 40 is about. And it's a lot of detail. Um, Frankly, it's pretty boring to read. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm not sure if that's a good thing for a pastor to say, but I got to be honest. It's it's very technical. It's very dry. It's very detail-oriented. But I believe that there's something for us in these chapters that describe uh, with great detail, you know, what... um, the priestly garments should look like, just how the sacrifices should be done, what the particular uh, construction methods and materials of this tabernacle, this this tent, this portable church, essentially, this portable meeting place for God and his people, what it should look like. Um, There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of detail, a lot of measurements using units of measure that we no longer use. but I, there's, a, there's a, a section here at the end of 29 that I want to read that I think captures well both the detailed description and, and the purpose of it all. And so hear God's word for us this morning from Exodus 29. I'm starting to read in verse 38. This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs a year. To, sorry, two lambs a year old. Offer one in the morning and the other at twilight. 
With the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with a quarter of a hin of oil from pressed olives and a quarter of a hin of wine as a drink offering. Sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning. A pleasing aroma, a food offering presented for the Lord. For generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. And so I will consecrate the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and the altar will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Lord, thank you for your word. Though we admit and confess that parts of it seem so strange to us, we need your Holy Spirit to guide us and to speak to our hearts and to our lives in the moment that we are in, to help us make sense of how you are alive and at work in our midst today, as you have been in the midst of your people for generations. Thank you for your word. Be our teacher this morning. Amen. So hopefully you captured a bit of of a couple of things in that passage. One, again, the detail and the specificity around the instructions for this offering that was to be done. And this is just one of many offerings that are described in these chapters. Uh, Again, not even including all of the other regulations and measurements and things like that, that clearly demonstrate the importance of of the creation of this tabernacle and the importance of um, the, the weightiness of what it was for a holy God to meet with a sinful, broken people. That God's perfection and his holiness and his beauty were not things to be trifled with. And that our our sin and and our brokenness are not some things that we can just sort of discard and not uh, not be honest about, not make account for. And, And so there is a sense in which even in these regulations, there is grace. There is a way forward for God and God's people to meet together. For them to know him as their God who brought them out of slavery and for, and for God to dwell among them. The sum total of all these instructions, right, is to increase, I think, the, the Israelite sense of the holiness of God. And perhaps to make them more and more aware of their own sinfulness, but also for them to see that there is a way that God is making for those things to come together. And again, the purpose of all of this, as Moses says, I'll reread this here, that that he will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. The purpose of all of this is intimacy. The purpose of all of this is a relationship of trust between God and his people. And I hope you heard the word dwell repeated a couple of times there. That's an important word. Remember that. Uh, If we move forward in the history of Israel to the place where now they have established themselves in the promised land, uh, the tabernacle becomes the temple. In the desert, uh, as they are a wandering people, the tabernacle is a portable tent, and everything about it is designed to be uh, set up and then torn down and then moved and then set up again. Uh, In Jerusalem, as the city is built, uh, the temple is a more permanent and larger version of the tabernacle. Now, as we move even further forward in the history of God's people to the New Testament, uh, we still encounter these words, the tabernacle and the temple. But in the New Testament writers, the gospel writers and Paul, uh, these take on new significance and new meaning. Next week, next week begins Advent. I don't know if you can believe that. That's crazy to me. But next week begins Advent, and we are going to hear read and preached and uh, through song and and arts, we're going to encounter a lot of the early parts of the gospel story. And one of the best ones is John's gospel. And there's this bit in verse 14 that says this, 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's John 1.14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You may have heard Eugene Peterson's take on that verse. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Now, the Greek that, that those translations are taken from, uh, there's this word skenu there. And that is the same word that the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uses to talk about dwelling. And it is also the word that gets translated as tabernacle. So the word became flesh and tabernacled with us. This is God's desire and God's heart uh, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation, all the way through till now. God's desire is to tabernacle with us, to be with us, to dwell with us. Similarly, uh, as tabernacle is kind of given new meaning in the person of Jesus, uh, temple is also given a bit of a new definition in the New Testament. Paul writes this, uh, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Uh, our, our bodies are given uh, extra value in the New Testament, not less, extra value, because they are the places where God's Holy Spirit dwells, tabernacles, with us. So this whole, all this language of, of temple and tabernacle um, get new definition, more profound, uh, incredible insight into what God's heart is with his people in the New Testament, where in the person of Jesus and within each own indivi- each individual, uh, we have the gift of knowing God ourselves. We don't have to go to a temple and, and our relationship is not mediated by a priest or by a series of sacrifices. Um, and all of this work All of the the work of preparation and sacrifices, all of that has been fulfilled in Christ so that we can come with boldness to know God, to talk with God as we would with a friend. And yet, God is still a holy God, completely other. And we are still a sinful, broken people whose sins need to be dealt with. And the good news, of course, is that Christ has provided a way. He has made a way for God's people to be with him and to dwell with them. And that our sin no longer separates us from God. And that all of, that's all been done once and for all with Christ's sacrifice on the cross. So the, the point of all of this, um, this movement from tabernacle and temple um, to God incarnate in Christ, dwelling within each one of us, in the Holy Spirit, uh, it's not to remind us just of how much we have to do to get God to like us and accept us. On the contrary, uh, it's to show us how much God has done on our behalf to make us holy. And so what is asked of us now is no longer this incredibly long list of regulations and making sure we're using the right weight of uh, incense or sacrificing just the right animal. Rather, what's asked of us now is simply trust faith, that we would place the weight of our lives on the faithfulness of Christ. And in trusting God with our lives, he moves towards us. He moves into us, dwells within us in the Holy Spirit, so that every moment of our lives can be set apart, can be holy. It's not just these singular moments of festivals when we would go up to the temple or the tabernacle once or twice a year, um, it's that every moment now can be filled with worship and filled with the holiness of God. Not because of anything that we've done, but because God has moved towards us in Christ and dwells, he tabernacles with us. I want to end with um, something that a number of us have found to be incredibly helpful, which is this, this book, which is essentially just a book of prayers called Every Moment Holy. And that, I believe, is really what this whole notion of God tabernacling tabernacling with his people is about, that every moment of our lives now has the capacity to be filled with the holiness and the beauty of God who dwells with us.
And this is a great resource. And they, they've done a, a wonderful job of uh, creating prayers and uh, liturgies and responsive readings for some of the most mundane moments in our lives. Precisely because the mundane moments in our lives are anything but. These are now moments that, because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, because Christ has come and set up his tent, his tabernacle in our, in our hearts, in our lives, in our actions, in our words, every moment has the capacity to be worship to God. To be a space where the holiness of God is, is lived out through our actions, through our words, and a, and, a, and a space where others can then be drawn to the beauty of Christ through us. So what I wanted to do was to um, read a liturgy, uh, pray a prayer, uh, a liturgy for domestic days. Domestic days, which during a pandemic with a stay-at-home order is every day. So this is a liturgy for domestic days. Many are the things that must be daily done. Meet me, therefore, O Lord, in the doing of the small, repetitive tasks, in the cleaning and ordering and maintenance and stewardship of things, of dishes, of floors, of carpets and toilets and tubs, of scrubbing and sweeping and dusting and laundering, that by such stewardship I might bring a greater order to my own life, and to the lives of any that I am given to serve, so that in those ordered spaces, bright things might flourish. Fellowship, companionship, creativity and conversation, learning and laughter and enjoyment and health. As I steward the small daily tasks, may I remember these good ends, and so discover in my labors the promise of the eternal hopes that underlie them. High King of heaven, you showed yourself among us as the servant of all, speaking stories of a kingdom to come, a kingdom in which those who spend themselves for love, even in the humblest of services, will not be forgotten, but whose every service, lovingly rendered, will be seen from that far vantage as the planting of a precious seed blooming into eternity. And so I offer this small service to you, O Lord, for you make no distinction between those acts that bring a person the wide praise of their peers and those unmarked acts that are accomplished in a quiet obedience without accolade. You see instead the heart, the love, and the faithful stewardship of all labors, great and small. And so, in your loving presence, I undertake this task. O oh God, grant that my heart might be ordered aright, knowing that all good service faithfully rendered is first a service rendered unto you. Receive then this my service, that even in the midst of labors that hold no happiness in themselves, I might yet have increasing joy. Amen. Your labor is not in vain Though the ground underneath you is cursed and stained Your planting and reaping are never the same Your labor is not in vain Your labor is not unknown Though the rocks they cry out and the sea it may groan The place of your toil may not seem like a home But your labor is not unknown For 
Called you, called you by name. 